Hi there. Hi, Lear Amigos. My name is Sarah Geiger, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Wyoming in the Plant Sciences Department. But more importantly, I'm a really avid, avid forager and also a mushroom hunter. So I wanted to spend a few minutes today to share with you um, some information and identifying characteristics about the top five edible mushrooms that you could be foraging for as well here in Wyoming. Um, before I do that, though, and let me move my little box up here. I love bad puns. So mushrooms, I wanted to remind you that mushrooms are not to be truffled with or trifled with. There's a great saying that says, there are old mushroom hunters. There are bold mushroom hunters, but there are no old and bold mushroom hunters. So this is a quick reminder um, to be really careful and be really confident about uh, knowing what you're eating and identifying the mushrooms that you find in the woods. So let's get started with my favorites here in Wyoming. I picked five, these are my favorite top five. I picked them because as someone living in Laramie, you should be able to go out into the general surrounding areas and natural forests um, and find these. So they, they're all local. Uh, they should be relatively easy for you to identify, particularly if you're a beginner. Um, you can get a little more savvy, but as a beginner, um, you should be able to find these. And then also, I like them and recommend them because there aren't really too many toxic lookalikes. Um, my biggest hint um, and suggestion for beginners would be to go out, know what you're looking for as a mushroom hunter. So find your top five edibles and just work to identify those. So these are really good for that because unless I talk about it a little bit, you shouldn't have um, too many poisonous lookalikes here. Good, good starting point. All right, let's get started. So this very first one is one of my favorites. And this is called a wood ear, if you haven't seen it before. It's kind of like, it takes you back a little bit. It's not your average um, you know, fruiting body out of the ground. As you can see from this picture, wood ears are really irregularly shaped um, and they kind of form cups and they sort of pucker up. They're gonna be a brown reddish hue. Certainly as you can see from this picture on this log here, and that's one that I took, uh, they can go bad over time. I'm moving my cursor here, but the sort of browner, wrinklier ones are not gonna be delicious, but those fresher, juicier ones on this log are awesome in stir fries. They're great for like thickening soups and things. You can dry them. So a lot of times you're gonna find these, this is like um, used in Chinese cuisine a lot and it's used in Chinese medicine. <laughs> you're gonna find them dried in, in a lot of Asian stores, but you can also eat them fresh as well in the stir fry. I'd say they're kind of mild, but they're, they're a really nice addition and a great way to both creep out and impress your friends, depending on, on what your friends are into. Um, here in Wyoming, we're gonna see them usually from July to September. I often find them um, after a good rain. I have found them in Happy Jack, that general area, if you wanna go kind of poking around. and Something to remember is that you're usually going to find these on, on sticks and on logs. They're not the type of fungus or like fruiting body of a fungus that you will see growing out of the ground. Um, they really, there's really nothing out there that you could confuse them for that might harm you if you ate it. Um, however, one thing like for me, I have noticed here in Wyoming that there's something called a brown cup fungus. I see those a lot. It could be confused for a wood ear. Here's how I know the difference. Uh, brown cup fungus is really sort of round. It grows uh, like a cup and it's gonna grow out of the ground. Um, it's a little bit crumblier and sort of, I don't know, it's not sort of pliable uh, like you'll see with a wood ear mushroom. So yeah, look for something that's kind of fun and, and jelly-like that way. So that's my number one. Perfect, you're not gonna poison yourself finding these in the woods. Um, just a reminder though, always do cook your mushrooms, any kind of mushroom that you pull out of the woods, cook it for sure. All right, my number two, I think a lot of people have heard about this and you can find them often in the grocery store. You can also grow them yourself really easily, but you can also forage for these. These are oyster mushrooms and um, oysters generally, these are other photos of oysters that I found. They are also generally going to be growing out of a log. Um, you might find them growing off of a tree as well, but they usually like dead wood. They're, they're important and good decomposers. The gills of a, of a oyster mushroom, are, they're gonna kind of run down the stem and you'll know it because it's a nice cream color. Um, and most importantly, this is a great identifying characteristic. 
Oyster mushrooms smell a little bit like licorice or like anise. Um, so give it a sniff. Uh, smelling mushrooms is a great way to help sort of identify what you're working with. Here in Wyoming, we have a really kind of short season where it's not so cold. So I would say look for these from June to October, probably more like June or July. But um, if you're closer to Jackson, you might find them a little bit earlier. Um, they also really like cottonwoods. So we have a lot of those here and aspens. Check around those. Um, there are some sort of little lookalikes. Particularly, they're called angel wings. Angel wings will not hurt you if you eat them, but they're not going to be good. They won't taste great. Um, they're a little bit smaller, but they look a, a lot like an oyster. Just be aware of that. Um, yeah, that's my number two. Number three here is the porcini. I have yet to, although I would love to, find a porcini here in Wyoming. Anecdotally, from my advisor at UW, I understand that they're, they're growing all over. Um, these guys are a little bit later. You're going to find them later in the year than the first two we talked about. Probably August, September time frame, maybe into October if, if we're not like getting snow at that time. Porcinis are great, um, like a choice, choice edible. They're great to identify because they, you'll see a very thick kind of stem on those guys, as you can see in the picture here. Very thick stem, kind of a cream color. And here's what I love. They're a bullet. So when you hear the term bullet, it means that they kind of have pores instead of a regular gill there. Um, that makes it a very easy thing to sort of identify, but also trickier. So I say this because there's all sorts of bullets. Um, with those, anything with a, with a gill or with the um, kind of those little tubes instead of a traditional gill as a mushroom, we're gonna generally call a bullet. And so um, a lot of them are edible. I wouldn't recommend going non-porcini if you're not, if, unless you're a really seasoned mushroom hunter, but you do wanna be aware that there's something called a, a false king bullet. I'm not sure how common it is out here west um, in this part of the country, but on the east coast where I'm from, you can definitely find them. So I wanted to bring your attention to that. These uh, false king bolettes are really identifiable though because they have this cool quality of staining. And that means that you can basically take your finger or something sharp and run it along that mushroom and within usually about a minute, but it could be up to five minutes, you'll start seeing a dark staining. I've included a picture down here to kind of help with that one. Um, and I also just want to point out, as if you're beginning as a mushroom hunter, you're going to want to avoid bullets in general that will stain. And you want to avoid ones that have sort of reddish pores. But yeah, King Bullet is super choice. And, and it loves sort of wet areas, as I've mentioned here, sort of riparian zones or wet areas um, and mixed fir forests. So very popular here in Wyoming. Oh, one other thing I wanted to note about them. Um, you may want to, if you are lucky enough to find some, you may actually want to sort of try to remove a little bit of that spongy layer um, with the little tubes underneath. They tend to hold on to a lot of water. There's absolutely nothing wrong with them, but I've heard kind of, again, anecdotally from folks that uh, it can be very wet. So I know a lot of people like to remove that, that layer right there to kind of, um, you know, keep it a bit drier during the cooking process. Right, moving on, chanterelles. These are sort of so close to my heart. I love these things. You can find them all over the country. Once you have found and correctly identified a chanterelle, you'll never mistake it for anything ever again. It's very, very distinct. Um, mostly I say that because it's got these kind of wavy edges. It's not always orange, but predominantly orange. I've found like red, red chanterelles that are gorgeous, but it's got these kind of wavy edges or lips. Um, and then most importantly, it's got what you call a false gill. So it doesn't sort of hit the stem and stop. The chanterelles actually have gills that are going to sort of run down and taper off down that stem. And that's really how you know that, that you have a chanterelle. They are so delicious and they're so good in butter. So I really recommend trying to find these. You should be aware though that um, there are some kind of lookalikes if you're just starting out. The first one is a jack-o'-lantern, which is a super cool kind of mushroom because it glows in the dark. Oddly, odd fact that a lot of people don't know. However, you don't want to eat that. That's, that's toxic. So I think I have a picture down here in number C of that jack-o'-lantern. Um, it tends to grow more like a little bit more of a pattern like the oyster mushroom, and it's a little more shelf-like. That's what I mean here. Also, its gills, um, or its I'm sorry, its edges are much more round and smooth than, a, than your average chanterelle. So 
if you've seen them both side by side, you should be able to tell the difference, but that, that could be easily confused. And then of course there's these false chanterelles too, sort of just an A down here, the bottom. Um, it's also bright orange. So <laughs> its gills are distinctly different than those false, um, false gills of chanterelle. But if I were you and I found a really beautiful bright orange mushroom, I would just do a little research to, to make sure that, um, that I wasn't dealing with the false chanterelle. You're gonna find them usually here in Wyoming. Again, elevation and wetness and temperature, these all make, they're kind of intertwined and they also all make a really big difference about when these will come up seasonally. But generally you should find them between July and October, depending on where you are. They love pine trees, they love Douglas firs and logical fine pine forests as well. Um, Often you will find them growing at the base of the tree, but I'm going to be honest and say I've literally found sort of fields of chanterelles growing as well. So I wouldn't, you know, always rely on that being at the base of a tree necessarily. And then finally, let's talk about morels, which is what I have had the most success here in Wyoming with. Um, as I mentioned, I'm from the East Coast, and if I were giving this presentation to an audience in the East Coast right now, I would probably have 20 delicious things that you could hunt down. We're a little bit more limited here in Wyoming, but man, chanterelles, or pardon me, morels are just like all over the place. So this is very exciting for me. I love these things. And you know what? If you were selling them commercially, they're like $30 or more a pound. So they're also kind of lucrative to find if you don't want to just totally indulge um, just for yourself. So. Uh, morels, some things that are important to know. Morels are going to come in yellow, aka golden, or black usually. Often you're going to find those yellow morels coming up first before the black ones. As you can see up here, this, this top photo on the slide, those are the real morels. And once you've kind of found them, they're really, really hard to mistake. They're a bit like a honeycomb. You know, they're a little bit like conical or egg shaped, as they say, or elongated. Although they come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. And really it can vary a lot in Wyoming when you're finding them. For me, I found them uh, in the, I believe, first week of July last year. That was a huge time here in the Laramie, Medbo, you know, the, the area that I'm living in near Laramie. However, I understand from sources in Jackson Hole that people are finding them as early as April. So it can really depend, but if you're sticking around here locally, Look in the first week of July, maybe second week of July for these guys. Um, they love cottonwoods, they love Douglas firs and lodgepole mixed forests. Um, they also do aspen mixed forests. I have to say I've had the best success finding them in burn areas. So, you know, we have plenty of those around here. And I really recommend that you spend an awesome Saturday walking around a burn area looking for these guys. It's really very gratifying, even if you don't find anything. Um, something you should be aware of briefly is that there is a lookalike. <laughs> I'm going to spend an extra slide in a second because this is a little bit of a bugaboo for me um, talking about false morels, but there's something called a broadly called a false morel um, that, that can be very bad to eat. Um, it's this guy at the bottom right. Um, once you've kind of seen both, it's really hard to mistake one for the other, but if you're just starting out, I could see where that be easily mistaken. Here's the number one important rule for making sure you're eating a true morel that, that is delicious. Uh, just cut it down that middle, kind of like the, the little picture I have at the bottom. If it's empty inside, you're good. You can be sure that that's, that's a true morel. Um, if it's not, then you're dealing with one of possibly many types of things called false morels. Um, yeah, so moving on here. A uh, quick note on false morels. This is like, as I just said, a bit of a bugaboo. A lot of times, and if you're, well, if you're just a beginner, it's probably very safe and very wise to assume that anything that looks like that false morel, just don't eat it. Uh, but it was driving me nuts, both my husband and I nuts, because for a long time, we had heard that there were false morels and that they were poisonous. And then we run into other mushroom hunters that are like, so committed to telling us how delicious these things are. And we were really confused and trying to figure out how that could possibly be. And the reality here is that within the genus of Gyromitra, you have some species, namely, and this is what we have here in Wyoming, this one that I'm circling with my cursor here, Gyromitra montana, that are really delicious. They just, they need to be cooked really well to denature some of the chemicals in there. 
they're really good. And then over here you have Gyromitra asculenta. I'm circling that here, super toxic. To an untrained eye, they look pretty similar. If you really get into mushroom hunting, you should helpfully be able to parse those out. Um, so yeah, so don't let people tell you that false morels, that all of them are totally toxic. It, it's a kind of a, a whitewashing of, of that genus in general, um, but some of them for sure are. And so if you really get into mushroom hunting, look into that more. I just want to flag it for you. Um, but if you're just beginning, just ignore those guys for now. Um, as I'm ending here, I wanted to put up some other really good resources that are going to be helpful, particularly if you're a beginning mushroom hunter. Uh, it's so, so helpful to be able to take photographs and post those to some forums and get like almost immediate feedback as to like what you're looking at and if you are correct. Um, some forums that we like are listed here. There's this mushroom ID group on Facebook. I know this is Facebook heavy, but they actually just have some really good resources. Uh, false morels demystified is going to help you sort out the gyromitra genus if you're finding those. Fungus identification is a good one. And then this, this one with lots of numbers at the bottom. That's a good one. That's the Let's of North America. Also, there, if you're a Redditor, there's a good mycology um, page for Reddit. Um, and then I've included here a website for AmericanMushrooms.com. If you like different types of field guides, here's my favorite one for this part of the country. It's called All That the Rain Promises and More. I love this guy. He's got like a trumpet and then some chicken of the woods there. It's really fun. It's a really good guide for like this part of the country. And then the National Audubon Society is a good trusted resource that you can go to as well. Um, that's the end of this is just highlighting the top five of my favorites here in Wyoming that you should be able to find if you're looking pretty closely. Um, if you really, really like this, please um, check out a link that should be included with this video. And that's a, a much longer presentation called Mushroom Hunting for Beginners that my husband and I put together. It's actually geared, we did it for the Washington DC Parks and Recs Department, but it includes lots of tips like how you would get started, what kind of gear you need for this hobby, that kind of stuff, the essential stuff. So I would encourage you to watch that. It's just a little bit longer. And then in the meantime, if you have questions, my email's below. I'm always happy to, to answer anything to the best that I can. Hope you guys have a great day and, and thanks so much for tuning in.